Welcome back to Seekistan. And I think this is the first video we've recorded in the office this year, is it? Yeah. Just Together. the two lads back at it. And it's 14th of uh, of January. Yeah. The Rona just went tuff, tuff, tuff. Yeah. The Rona came at us like 70 we've lost kilo black two belt. of our 52 weeks. We have actually. Yeah. But we still have those 52 weeks ahead of us, 50 weeks ahead of us. So, I mean, optimistic. As always. On my video yesterday of Craig Ritchie's snatch technique, someone asked a question that's a very reoccurring question. It's by Bartek N. He says, hey guys, what is your opinion on kettlebells, mace bells, club bells, and Bulgarian bags? Question mark. Do they have a place in strength and conditioning? Question mark. This is a question that comes up so regularly. I'd say nearly every live stream we do every week yeah. has someone ask it. On random videos like this, people will frequently ask it. I just want to preface this question with something. Now, I know what people are asking, right? People aren't asking, are these effective tools that I can put into a proper SNC program? I think what people are asking are, can I make my whole SNC program, club, kettlebells, maces, stuff like that, my whole program is around this and do Everything. those. Everything. Yeah. That's what people are asking, and I know that's what they're asking. So, if we're asking the question like that, the answer is no, not really. Uh, if you're asking the question, are they a nice little flavor? Little yeah, flavor, just a little, little flavor sprinkling. Spinking. Oh, baby, yes. Oh, yeah, very useful. Absolutely. Like the background of those implements, right? If, if you take everything there is a kettlebell, right? Everything on that list, those maces, the weird clubs, all that. We're just, we'll call it a kettlebell, right? Because that implement, that apparatus does one thing and it does it very well. It puts the center of mass of the object away from your center of control, right? So when I hold on to this fork and I hold on to the fork in the center of it, the center of mass of the fork is around my center of control with, I just threw it on the bin. How did you do that? I don't know, no idea. The center of control is roughly where the center of mass is. If I hold on to a dumbbell, the two weights are at the end. The center of mass of the dumbbell is roughly in the same area of my center control with my hands. On a barbell, the center of mass of the barbell is usually in between my two kind of points of contact. So I have very good control over it. When we have a kettlebell, when we have a club, when we have a mace, we hold on to that kettlebell. And the center of mass is outside of our grip or outside of our center of control or where we can kind of mainly manipulate it. So we then have a center of mass that's moving relative to where we're holding on to it. This is very, very useful for certain things that we'll talk about later, like stability, like dynamic movements. They're also very useful for a movement where you might want to accentuate an eccentric, uh, such as a very heavy kettlebell swing. We'll talk about that later on as well. So as we preface this video with, they're nice as a little sprinkling, but in the same way where we wouldn't use a cable crossover machine for everything, or we wouldn't use a barbell for everything, or we wouldn't use any tool we use in a strength and conditioning uh, context. They're just not, they're not a complete tool, but they do have their uses. Also, just to preface this before. Do you say preface or preface? Uh, or preface? I said preface. Preface. I say preface. You probably should say preface. Before, I know if there's one of you out there who's going to say this, where you're like, when I was in university and I was coming back from obesity hernia surgery, I used kettlebells and I won state boxing championships. That's class. And that's class for you, and I'm super happy for you. And please say that in the comments if you have done that, because <laughs> uh, comments are great. But uh, So there is some individual cases where people do stuff like this, and that's perfect. For the vast majority of people, we need to look at what does a good strength and conditioning program have? And do kettlebells, maces, mace balls, mace bags, club belts, eight balls, whatever, uh, do they match up to a strength and conditioning? Do they match these parameters that we need for a good strength and conditioning program? So if we take the first part of that word, that phrase, strength training, we're looking at things that's high force in general, so resistance training. Generally, if we're looking for high force, we're looking for more weight. Almost always we're looking for more weight on a bar. And the one of the most notable things is that we can get a feeling of hard training effect from a very light kettlebell. If we can do things like a bottoms up kettlebell press with 12 kilos, it feels so much harder. Even for an individual, for example, who can bench press 150 kilos for reps. A bottoms up kettlebell press, unilateral one, feels super difficult. Now, unfortunately, the feeling of super difficult or feeling of, of uh, 
the feeling of a difficulty of an exercise isn't really a direct correlation to how an effective an exercise that is. We mentioned one of these videos before that in general, for our S&C athletes, more weight is better. Heavier weights as much as possible through a reasonably full range of motion is gonna be much more productive than any perceived higher difficulty lifts, but with much, much less weight. For example, if we have someone like Shaq is an enormous athlete, he's super tall. Massive. Or take someone like Haftor Bjornsson. Let's say Haftor Bjornsson is training for the world's strongest man. Now he needs to produce incredibly high forces. Let's say he's trying to increase his back squat. His single arm fucking split squat with a kettlebell overhead at 12 kilos is going to be of absolutely zero productive use in a direct force production scenario to increase his heavy back squat. It's just not going to be effective. We know that's not true. He's 200 kilos. Will a 20 kilo bottoms up kettlebell press be effective in improving his absolute strength? No, absolutely not. It just won't be. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. So we know at certain stages, a heavy weight move through a full range of motion is just much more productive to incur positive adaption on your organism as a whole. Benching 200 kilos for reps as a 100 kilo Jiu Jitsu athlete is almost certainly going to be much more productive than 20 kilo bottoms up kettlebell presses. Now, it's not exclusive that you can do both. But in general, people aren't really doing the first one a lot and they might be able to do the second one, but that heavy weight is so important. Just the overall effect, having heavier weights, when we put them on a barbell or put them on a safety bar, whatever the fuck it is you're using, these heavier weights under a full range of motion. So we're not talking about heavy weights to a quarter squat, even though in certain places they do have a benefit. Just these heavy weights incur a very positive effect, very positive training adaption on our force production. Heavier weights require more force to produce. And when we're looking for an athlete and we're looking at ourselves in that force velocity curve, and if we need a certain amount of force production, we're not going to get that through different kind of angles of force, or different kind of mom moment arms and a kettlebell or a mace bell. We're really going to get that through just heavier weight in the barbell through an exercise that has a reasonably full and safe range of motion. And we're just not really going to get that through 30 rep sets of mace belt swings or eight ball snorts. So what about the conditioning piece, Darren? Well, I was going to talk about where they may be useful, but maybe we'll talk well, about conditioning and then I'll do yeah, the useful bit at the end. Let's get to the second part of that. So the second piece of this is conditioning. So conditioning, however you want to, to kind of divvy it up or what you consider conditioning to be, is basically you altering your current physiology to be better able to carry out the task you're trying to do, right? Conditioning for a rugby player is very different from conditioning for a marathon runner, very different from conditioning for a weightlifter, right? These are all on a varying scale of aerobic to anaerobic work. But predominantly, by and large, conditioning is to do with the aerobic system, how well we're able to carry out a certain amount of work capacity. So what conditioning usually looks like or what conditioning usually feels like is it's usually an out of breath, difficult to do, quite high tempo piece of work. And then we're trying to bring about positive physiological changes. People make the mistake in conditioning the same way they made the mistake that Owen just talked about in strength training, where if they feel really tired or it felt really difficult, that it's going to be a great thing to put you in really good condition. We can train a 10 year old monkey to PT someone into making someone really tired. Like it's the most simple thing in the world. Make someone really tired, make them feel like they work their abs and their glutes and they'll be happy after a session. But it's not the most productive thing. And a lot of the time what we see when we see heavy conditioning pieces with kettlebells or with these different implements involved is they're just making people more broken down, right? So big advantage of a heavy kettlebell swing, and it's one of the useful areas of a heavy kettlebell swing, is that we have a quite large uh, force in the eccentric portion. So because we're swinging the kettlebell up to eye level or possibly above eye level, it's then coming down with a fair amount of momentum and a fair amount of force that eccentric or the stopping force, so the lengthening of that muscle under tension is quite severe. We then have that amortization phase as we bring the kettlebell to a stop in between our legs, and then we turn that around and turn it into a concentric force as we push forward. Due to the fact that there's momentum in that eccentric phase and that we then control the bottom of that eccentric phase, turning it into an amortization phase, the breakdown in those tissues of the erector spinae, some of the glutes, some of the hamstrings, it's going to feel like we're doing a huge amount of work, but is that work necessarily 
beneficial to you? Probably not. A lot of the time when people do their conditioning, they do their conditioning far too intensely. So the amount of time they're conditioning for is usually too short. Usually they're never getting into that kind of 20 to 45 minute time bracket. People really like sticking to high intensity interval training because they feel like, okay, it's only 12 minutes, I'm getting a lot of work done. Uh, and research has shown in inverted commas that it can be as effective as traditional aerobic training. Whereas if you look at a triathlete, if you look at a marathon runner, if you look at a 1600 meter runner, their aerobic work they're doing isn't being done in a, a kind of hit class style workout where it's only lasting for 12 minutes. They will do a large volume of work. Uh, swimmers in the same way will do a large volume of work and they're bringing about very, very necessary physiological adaptations changes in blood values, changes in blood volume, changes in the cell itself to allow us to process more oxygen more efficiently, replacing more of that ATP and keeping those glycogen levels kind of topped off for longer. So it's it's longer before we start redlining in workouts and really hitting kind of lactate threshold or any of those values. So if we've kind of established that it's not great as our main tool for strength training and we've kind of established that it isn't really that productive for conditioning. Is there a place for it? Absolutely. But I think we just need to be clear on what people are really asking us and can they make their whole training system around using mace bells and clubs and kettlebells and all this stuff? And not really. But you can certainly sprinkle these in to other parts of your training and they can be phenomenally productive. So we can have stuff like a waiter's press or a waiter's walk with a bottoms up kettlebell, bottoms up kettlebell presses, overhead walk. I've heard now, I haven't used a mace ball, but I've heard people have had a great time rehabbing their shoulders using them. So where can you use these in positions where it is some single leg stuff? It's great uh, in places where it just replaces a dumbbell in a unilateral aspect. So it's just literally the use of these work perfectly for the unilateral side. So if you're doing like split squats or single arm presses or single arm dumbbell bench or something like that, there's no reason you can't use a kettlebell. Uh, they work very, very well for these kind of unilateral movements. They work great. The little bit of extra stability is still quite productive because you're still on a stable platform and you're putting force through a solid piece or a solid medium on the ground. But then the particular joint you're working has to work to stabilize if you do go, for example, for a bottoms up movement at a kettlebell or something like that. They're very useful for core exercises. They can be very, very useful in a rehab context or a prehab context. And then maybe general bodybuilding and stuff like that, they're very, very useful as a supplementary, supplementary kind of assistance movement exercise. So very, very specific cases, these kind of odd implements can be very, very useful. For example, Bulgarian bags or, or sandbags is, used to be all the rage when we started training like My God. 10, 12, 15 years ago. Sandbags were the thing to have or a keg. If you could get a keg, which I was able to get by the way. I had kegs, yeah. It so useful. Uh, for wrestlers and stuff when they're kind of sports specific training they do seem to like to use kettle or used to like bulgarian bags or sandbags find that very very productive strong wind would very very useful for us in terms of probably sports specific activity of holding something like this that's ungainly that's a heavy object and it's a large uh, surface area then in those specific cases they're very very useful but in the can this be the main driver and the main training system that i do my snc around we just haven't really seen it being that productive and it doesn't follow the principles or allow you to extrapolate and expose the principles of what a good SNC program would be. The final point I'd make on this is the major advantage with this stuff, right, is it's very, very stowable. The barrier for entry is quite low. You can buy a kettlebell for 30 euro, depending on what weight it is. Uh, you keep it underneath your stairs and everyone has one at home uh, or a lot of people have them at home. One thing I will say, though, is that although the barrier for entry appears to be quite low, in order to do more training at home, right? So in order to, obviously, if you're in a lockdown scenario where you wanted to start doing your strength pieces at home, uh, you'd need a, a fairly robust range of kettlebells. You'd probably need at least three kettlebells. At least. Uh, you'd probably need some bands then to make up for the, the lacking of where the kettlebell might lack. You'd probably need some sort of prepared area at home to do it in. And I would just say that you can very, very quickly do a cost-benefit analysis of buying a cheap beater bar with a couple of pairs of plates and suddenly for not the same amount of investment, but for just slightly more, you have a much more robust uh, 
collection of implements that you can use for training and you can actually do some some much more beneficial training and, and kind of long term hold on to those pieces of equipment uh, and get more bang for your buck. One thing I would finish with and it's maybe a rhetorical question is why wouldn't you do normal straightforward strength conditioning stuff? They work really well if you do them right. Because I'm special. Or no, no, no. no but they're special. They work really well. Shh. Shh. They work really well if you do them correctly. <laughs> like there's no reason. A lot of times people want to do things odd or there is almost a negative bias towards the kind of meathead activities, just stereotypical strength conditioning. The, the funny thing is, smart strength conditioning is like common sense. It's in no way common. We're all vaguely aware of the idea of what strength conditioning is. And it's like squatting, benching, deadlift, high intensity interval training and steady state cardio and newly lateral stuff. And everyone's kind of like, oh, but there's a reason it works. There's almost like a negative bias towards that or a negative viewpoint from people when it comes to just flat out like conditioning and strength training and it works super well and there's no reason it wouldn't work for you i can understand if you just wanted to do general training just for exercise for life i could be i think that would be very interesting and i can see why people would like that but for s and c work because that's what this person specifically asks uh there is no reason i feel like stereotypical is a wrong word just like good old-fashioned Good, honest to God. Honest to God. Like the S&C people who work. pay, who are paid to be strength and conditioning coaches, what they get their athletes to. Yeah, that that stuff. There's no reason. This kettlebell stuff. This is not. It doesn't work better than do this. The best reason for it. Why? Because you can get those kettlebells that looks like an ape's head. I do like those. Are the they demons. look class? You know the ones that look like the, the demons? gargoyle boils. Yeah, if someone if uh, gargoyle bells. Gargoyles. If uh, yeah, like that. They they look great. They're like, class. I'd love to have one, but yeah. for your S and C. It just isn't really it. It helps a little bit, but it's not, shouldn't be the main driver, I don't think. It's because I'm special.